Good morning, Stone Point. Hey, we'd like to welcome you guys. Um, those who are in, in Edgewood, we welcome you, and also those who are online. Um, my name is Edward. This is Charlie, and along with Brandon, we get to uh, help lead this, uh, this body. And uh, today, um, we just wanted to come before you, and we have uh, an announcement to, to make, and I'll give it to Charlie. Hey, good morning. Hey, I want to start off with reading just a reading a little verse from you to you from the just a, a letter to the church of Thessalonia and it's from Paul Silas and Timothy and in chapter 5 excuse me chapter 5 verse 12 it reads now we ask you brothers and sisters to acknowledge the work of those among you who care for you in the Lord and then in verse 13 it says hold them in the highest regard in love because of their work so we're going to talk about Brandon for a second. We, we want to acknowledge the work that he does, and we want to hold him in the highest regard. And we, we do that in, in, because we love him. And about a, a little over 11 years ago, he planted this church among this other people, and he's been working tirelessly for 11 years, and, and we, we recognize that. So just to tell you exactly what's happening, we're going to send him on a sabbatical. We're going to ask him to come up here in a minute. But... So at the, at the sabbatical for him will be two months. It'll start July 3rd, and it'll, which is right before Independence Day. And then we'll come back on Tuesday, the 6th of September, which is the Tuesday after Labor Day. So that'll give him two months to refresh and renew and get himself rejuvenated because he's tired. Uh, when he shared this with uh, his children just two nights ago, one of his children responded, Dad, are they trying to reward you for all the nights that you're never here? And it touched Brandon in a, in a deep way because he speaks sometimes at region on Monday nights. He does journey groups on Tuesdays and Thursday nights. Wednesday nights, he's poured into your children, the youth of his church. Um, and Sunday, obviously, he's here. So he's usually gone probably five nights a week. Uh, lots of times you'll see him among the communities just loving on kids at their athletic events just to encourage them and, and, and being available to them. So here's what this would I'd, I'd like it to look like or, or we would like it to look like. And I'll, I'll use a silly analogy. Brian Cole's a tech, tech guy. So let's say Brian Cole and I work together, and I see him walking in the hallway, and I, I have this need, and it's, I'm spontaneous. I go, hey, Brian, can you come over and help me with my computer? And he's caught. A lot of times we do something similar to that with our pastor. We might see him at a restaurant, or we see him in a bout, or we have him between services, and we go, hey, Brandon, can you? And we, we, kind, of, we kind of dump on him the things that are going on in our life, the, the needs that we have. And so dump away, get him away, get, do all you can to him in the month of June. But if you, but if you, to love him well, and, and the message would say, let's overwhelm him with love. That's the words that they would use in First Thessalonians 5, 12, and 13. So to overwhelm him in love is almost to ignore him in a, in a sense. If we were to see him about, we could say hi to him, love him, ask him how he's doing, encourage him, appreciate him, but let's not ask things of him because he's, he's been a little bit drained. He's been tired. We all have been there at times, right? So as a church body, to love him well and, over, and just do it well, is let's leave him alone for the month of July and the month of August until after Labor Day. And then he'll come back refreshed and ready to jump back on board with the rest of our staff and continue leading and, and doing all the work that they do for all of us. Y'all say amen to that? So let's bring him up here and let Brandon know how much we love him. Yeah, not to say that, that Brandon is, is weary of doing good. That's how you say it, right? Tongue tied. But anyway, uh, we, we, uh, this is going to happen so he doesn't grow that way. And so we, we recognize that. Um, that he needs a rest. He needs to be refreshed in the Lord, and um, this is the means for that. So um, with that, let's pray. Father God, thank you for um, my brother Brandon, Lord. I thank you for um, just what he means to this body, Lord, just the, the leadership that, you, um, that you've given him over this church, Lord, the zeal in which that he um, performs that leadership, Lord, the gifting that you've given him in that, Lord. And um, Lord, I just thank you for your faithfulness, um, Lord, and just um, allowing just the ability to, to take a break, Lord, to, to, to rest, to reflect, to, um, to dive deep 
with you, Lord, and just, um, I just pray for his time that he's going to have away, Lord, and I just pray for um, the other leaders in this body, Lord, that, that um, have the opportunity to, to do even more to love others um, in his absence, Lord, and um, we just trust you with that, Lord. Lord, I want to pray for the message that you've given him this morning, and I pray for um, that it'll be encouraging to our hearts, Lord, and help us to become more um, in tune to you, and I pray for folks who don't know you, Lord, that um, they'll be drawn to you, and um, we ask this in Christ's name, amen. Hey, one, one other thing I wanted to say, and I forgot to say, is he's still, you'll still see him at church if he's not out of town. He's still going to be here on Sundays. He'll still be in community with those he's in community with, so he's not just going to go AWOL. He'll be still around and all that, and 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 ever alluded to just in, in Matthew eleven twenty eight, it gives us a promise: "Come to me, all who are weary and heavy burdened, and I will give you rest." So and that's what we want for for Brandon. So, Norm, he does. Thank you. <laughs> Friends, I am humbled um, at the kindness of our church family, and uh, certainly the guys I lead with. Um, I'm also humbled by the response of my kiddos uh, who say, hey, Dad, like, that's awesome that they're going to reward you for your hard work. And the recognition of that from my family um, is incredible. And, friends, I just want you to know, and I pray that today's message encourages us, um, that really the reason I need to take a couple of months away is also to remind our staff that they have great gifts and they don't need me. And you need to know that. You need to know that you don't need me. Uh, this is not Stone Point because I, I'm here. This is God's church, and it's because of his people. And it's because of your faithfulness and the faithfulness of people I lead with. And so our greatest prayer in humility is that you won't see any difference in anything we do. Um, yeah, you might have to see a teaching over video, and my, pr my prayer would be that you don't grumble or complain in that because you know um, that it's us using our resources as wisely as possible in a time where we are going to ask our staff and other people in our body to, to really pull and carry my load. And um, just pray that you'd be patient with that. Uh, but know this, the only reason I'm taking a break is so that I can come back and with zeal and fervency lead for another 11 years with humility and God's grace. And so I look forward to it. Uh, you might ask, well, what in the world are you going to do? And I'm like, I already got plans to lead our kids well. I've, we've already been talking about what our days are going to look like as I get to just spend time with my kids and uh, also navigate that my wife is still working uh, tirelessly and fervently. And so in many ways, I'm going to get to just hang out with my kiddos and love them and serve them and bless them and uh, disciple them in ways that um, they have my full attention. And I'm looking forward to it. Um, and so thank you. It's not without your generosity. It's not just two men. It's, it's really the generosity of our church. And so thank you. I'm humbled, deeply humbled, that you would allow me some kind of way. Um, if you've got your Bibles, turn with me to Romans chapter 12. And as you're doing that, let me just pray for us so that we can um, transition um, wisely um, to uh, this text as we continue in this series called Romans Revealing the Righteousness of God. And... Um, and hey, we're going we're gonna to go at lightning speed, and so I'll go ahead and give you an uh, advance. If you've got a pen, go ahead and grab it. You'll need it, um, and we're going we're gonna to jump in because uh, I have not lost my zeal, okay? Um, <laughs> Father in heaven, we love you. Pray, God, that you would use your word to increase our faith, and Lord, let's help us to realize how valuable we are to the body of Christ, that it's not about one man or one woman or one person's talent, but Lord, it's a collective unit that you desire for the church body to be. Uh, remind us of that. Show us a few things maybe we haven't seen before. Um, use your spirit to convict our hearts, encourage us, remind us. And in some cases, maybe you want to rebuke us. I don't know, Lord, but you do, and we trust that you'll do what you only can do. In Jesus' name, amen. So if you've got your Bibles, turn with the Romans chapter 12. You're already there. Uh, we're going to continue this, and, and we're all already in the practical section of Romans. 
Uh, the first 11 chapters um, are very weighty, uh, very practical, very helpful. But now we're into the part where it's, it's just applicable. And as Paul is diving into this particular uh, text, he, he begins in Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, in which if you want to see the full-length message, you can go to our website and review it from three weeks ago uh, on our website. And I think it sums up Romans 12, 1 and 2 very well. But I want to read it just so you remind yourself of the context of what Paul is saying here. He says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercy of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Paul addressing to the church of Rome, he says, listen, what God desires most of the believer is that you would be holy and blameless. The idea there is consecration, to be set apart, that you would be radically different. And then he says, you're not to be conformed to to the world. Uh, Then he goes on, he says, but to be transformed by the renewal of your mind. And he gives us the idea in the Greek of a metamorphosis, the the idea that you would be changed, that you would uh, be one way here, and then ultimately because of the resurrection of Christ Jesus and your belief in him that you would be different, that you would experience the renewal of your mind, that you would be able to test and discern what is the will of God, what is good, acceptable, and perfect, all because you now walk by his spirit, enabled by him to acknowledge what it looks like to be a living sacrifice. And we talked about a couple, a few weeks ago that the, the greatest challenge we likely will have is staying on the altar because we want to crawl off of the altar. And, and, and friends, it, to be a living sacrifice means that we're not dead, but we continue to actively pursue all that God has for us. But then he does a, a slight t- uh, turn here in his letter to the church of Rome. And he says this in verse 3, For it is by grace given to me that I say among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. Now what he's talking about, though, is this. He goes, now look, if you are to be a living sacrifice, a holy, pl- uh, blameless before the Lord, you are to be consecrated and set apart for him, and you're not to be conformed to the pattern of the world, but to be transformed, to the renewing your mind, and you're trying to discern what is good and acceptable and perfect. He goes, you need to realize that it's by grace that I'm talking to, and then he says, everyone among you. And then he implores them, and he encourages them to this, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought. Now, the reason he's saying this is because in context of what he's about to say in the letter, he's talking about specifically this idea of spiritual gifts. And as we go through uh, these handful of verses, Romans 12, 3 through 8, we're also going to uh, look at another passage, 1 Corinthians 12, in a few moments. One of the things that you need to realize is that Paul is talking at great length about these gifts. And these spiritual gifts, he goes, look, they, they're important for all of us. And he goes, and more than anything, he goes, if you're not careful, they'll cause you to think more highly of yourself than you ought. So his warning, really, before he even gets into the idea of gifts at all, he just says, hey, be careful that you are of sober mind. You have sober judgment because each is according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. And so I'm going to show you five things that, about spiritual gifts in a second. But the very first one that you need to see is this, is that Paul is imploring the church of Rome to not get arrogant or boastful in their spiritual gifts. And here's why. He is saying that each is giving according to the measure of faith that God has assigned, which means the more, spiritual, the more significant spiritual gifts are never evidence for greater spirituality. What Paul is saying, he goes, listen, the, the, you need to realize is that the, the more significant gifts that you're going to talk about, we're going to show, he goes, they are not evidence of mature faith at all. Let me put that for you up on the screen so you can see that. The more significant spiritual gifts are not evidence of greater spirituality. Why, do, why does Paul say that? He goes, listen, you need to make sure that you don't get caught up in this idea that there are certain gifts that God values more than others. That there are certain things that you should be looking for as you grow in spirituality that in some ways would bring about a greater amount of gifts. Because the point is, Paul says, look, it's all given according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. Which is really important, because if God is the one who assigns and gives good gifts to his people spiritually for ultimately his own good, then it means that there's nothing for us to be arrogant or proud about. But can I just tell you that the wickedness of our heart, oftentimes we want to elevate or esteem ourselves 
Sometimes it's because we want a pat on the back, or we want recognition, or more than that, we want others to see how great our gifts are. But Paul says, hey, be careful of that. And I, he goes, I say that to everyone among you, which the reason he says that to everyone among you is because sometimes we have a false view of humility about ourselves. And we go, oh, I'll never get there. The problem is we, we can be quick to get there. We can easily drift. We can easily drift into the thinking that I am indispensable. And friends, if I could just say to you, that's the one thing I want you to hear about me. I am not indispensable. I can be replaced by God for his kingdom work at a moment's notice, and his church will not cease to do its job in any way. And here's the deal. If it does, it says less about who you are than about me. Hear that. If this is about me, it says that the collective church is not doing its job. And unfortunately, that is on me, and I will give an account to God for that. But it's also on the body of Christ, which is why he goes on to say such a thing in verses 4 and 5. Look what he says. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. He relates that just to the human body, which is very clear. We have many parts in our body, correct? And they don't all have the same functions. Thank the Lord. Verse 5, so we, so as a result of what he just shared in verse 4, he says, so we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Now, what's interesting is he goes, listen, there are several things to take note of. He goes, one, we all belong to one another. We are all one body. But he goes, also, he goes, we don't independently work separate of one another. Like, we all work together. We have to have one another, just as your human body has to have all of its parts working properly. He goes, that is true of the local church. The reality is that means that every single one of us actually benefits when you are working the way that God designed you to work. So it means that every single part actually in tandem working together honors and glorifies God. And it should remind us that we can't become proud or haughty because we, one, are not indispensable, and two, we are nothing without all of the rest of our parts. For instance, what is your arm without your head? The point is, Paul is trying to make, and very clearly, is that these gifts are given by God for his glory and are good. But even more than that, that the way that it functions should honor and glorify God. Now, let me show you a few things here. I encourage you to take notes because I think it's mind-blowing. And I encourage you to lean in because you, you might check out here real quickly. But in verse 4 and 5, I want you to see just a handful of things. When you see one body there, the word that comes to mind for me is unity. That, that we would be unified. Okay? Then you see here that not only is it one body, but you see that there are many members. When I think about many members, I think about equality. I think about equality in the many members, that regardless of who you are or what you are or what you look like or where you come from, that ultimately we all have dignity and worth and value for God. We are all his image bearers, and we all have unique gifts given by God, and one is not greater than the other, because ultimately if our gifts do not show spiritual maturity, then it means that all gifts have great value. And so not only do you see the idea of oneness here, but you also see the idea of equality, that you see a necessary part in all the gifts. But it didn't stop there. They all have different functions, right? Paul says, just as our bodies have different functions, he goes, that's true for the body. So are we. So if the body has different functions, here's what I see. I see the word diversity. Diversity means that we come in different gifts, shapes, sizes, colors, right? All of us are diverse. Then you also see this, though, that we're also individual members of one another, that we all work in tandem collectively together. And I see when you have that many members, I see one of two things present. You could have chaos or you could have order. And God's design is that you would have order. Now, here's why I give you unity, equality, diversity, and order. The reason I give you those things is because those are the things that you actually see present in our triune God. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Three in one. You have plurality, don't you? You have three, many, though one. What's incredible, though, is you also have great significance in each role. 
So in, in their diversity, the fact that they all do different things, the Father is the foundation of all, he's the architect, Jesus is the builder, he's the life sustainer, he's the salvific one, the comforter, the Holy Spirit, the one who enables man to do the will of God, to enable him to do what the Father and the Son have orchestrated, all of them working together, they are equal. One is not greater than the other. Never did you see the son say to the father, hey, I'm going to do my own thing. But what did he say? Not my will, but thy will be done. And so in the midst of diversity, you have this incredible unity. You have this oneness there displayed. And and then it doesn't just stop there. It's in this diversity, you have order, right? All of them working together, though equal in all their roles. You see that? So what you see in the triune God between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, friends, guess what? It's also to be seen in the church. Listen, it doesn't stop there, friends. It's also to be seen in your marriage. One of the great reasons I believe in the God of the Bible is because these things transcend time and space. It's not just useful for the church. You you see the very things that are displayed in the triune Godhead to be applicable for the church, but also for your marriage, which means as husbands, we can never look at our wives and believe in our hearts that in some ways we have a greater value or worth than our wife does. We are equal. Paul goes to great length to say that even to the church of Galatia. Hey, whether whether you're Jew or Gentile, slave or free, it doesn't matter, male or female. He goes, what? You all have worth and dignity. Now, I am not negating this fact that men will give an account for their families. I am not negating the fact that men have great leadership roles and very significant ones in which God desires for you to fulfill within your family. But what I am saying is we are foolish as if men, we think that we are 51% of the equation and our wife is 49%. That is a misnomer, and it is a, it is a very big problem if you view that. Because there is never a point where the father thinks that he is greater than the son, or the son thinks he's greater than the spirit. They all are one. They are all equal. They're all diverse, and they all are unified in what they do. Friends, that's true in marriage. Which is why we love our Savior, right? The one who did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. The one who submitted himself to the Father. Friends, that's the goal. It is glad submission. Not using our rank or our title to say, you know what, you owe me something. And friends, I would just tell you, I think you could take some of these very similar concepts and apply them to the workplace. If you are a senior leader in your workplace, the goal is not to say, hey, I'm going to use my trump card and I'm going to show you my power. Friends, if that's the way you lead, you're leading with a hatchet rather rather than with a symbol of God's grace and love and humility. See, at the end of the day, the goal is is for us as husbands to love our wives as Christ loved the church. Isn't it two people becoming one flesh? Paul's point here, and I don't want to get lost in marriage, although that's really good. Paul's point is, is that we humbly serve one another within the church. All parts are necessary, which leads me to point number two and three out of verses four and five. Number two is that every Christ follower has at least one gift by the Spirit. And I should have written more. If I were to write more, I would say to contribute to the local church. Because it is not enough to acknowledge that God has given us all one gift. The point is God gave us at least one gift to be used as a contribution to the greater whole. Which means if you're not using any of the gifts that God has given you to the greater whole, then the likely part of that is that you are being disobedient to a heavenly father who gave you good gifts for the local church. That's the point. So Paul says, though there are many members, so we too are many members. So we should realize that we all have at least one gift. Peter addresses that in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's very grace. At least one gift is given for the common good of those around you and the glory of God throughout the earth. The third thing, though, is that you just need to know there are no insignificant gifts. There's nothing insignificant. Oh, we recently read a book called The Fred Factor um, with our staff, and it's about a mailman who goes over and beyond in servicing his customers. But what's interesting is, is in the book, there's a quote um, that says, there are no unimportant jobs, just people who feel unimportant doing their jobs. 
And I want to leave that up on the screen for a few moments while I talk through something real quick. Let's just say that we're all in DFW Airport, and we're getting ready to fly on a little summer vacation. And we look around, and there's hundreds of patrons enjoying the food court area. Now, how long would it take for the food court area to be um, really just in disrepair and overcome with trash if there was not a handful of custodial people going around picking up the trash? Now, let's just say that we left the the airport there for two hours and there was no one to pick up the trash as people ate their food. How long would it take for you to discover the importance of the custodial staff that was not doing their job? Now, let me ask you this question. When's the last time do you think a custodial staff at DFW Airport was pulled aside by someone and said, hey, can I just tell you how significant your job is? Can I tell you that if if you weren't doing such a great job today that within hours this entire airport would be overcome with trash and complaints and insults? See, the point is is that even us, we don't see or oftentimes value the tasks that are taking place around us because if not careful, we esteem the pilots and the staff and we don't allow our eyes to take just to take in the view of some of the trivial things that we think are unimportant. Can I just tell you, there are no unimportant jobs, just people who feel unimportant in their job. I think you could transfer that over to gifts of the Spirit. Friends, you and I oftentimes don't see or take note of all the many things that are transpiring here within our local body week in and week out, day in and day out. Friends, I think sometimes our eyes are drawn to those who have what we would implore as greater gifts, teaching or leadership. And we look at them, we go, oh man, you're doing such a great job. And and friends, I'll just tell you, I oftentimes get encouraged in great ways. But I see a lot of my friends who never get encouraged in great ways. And if not careful, what they do is continue to go doing on their gifts or their roles. And we can tell them how important it is, but the problem is we never actually tell them how important it is. And maybe that's you. Maybe you're here and you go, you know what? I just feel insignificant in my gifts. Can I just tell you, there are no insignificant gifts. God has apportioned each of us a gift to use for his glory and the good of those around us. And I can tell you, as insignificant as I thought my shoulder was a few months ago, my shoulder is significant. Now, I'll tell you, a few months ago, I was playing some basketball with some teenagers who were faster and stronger not better, but faster and stronger. <laughs> um, and uh, one of them, as we're coming down, I kind of go in and I'm going to rip the ball. And, and he's literally like 6'3", about 215, and he takes my shoulder with him. And like I haven't felt such pain since my college football days. And I was like, oh, my goodness. That night I couldn't sleep on my shoulder, and I just toughed it out for the next couple of months. We had stuff coming down the pipeline. We had Easter. We had other stuff. I'm like, I don't have time to go to the doctor. So eventually, through pressing into my community and a handful of people I love, they're like, dude, you have to go to the doctor. So I go to the doctor. They give me a cortisone shot, and they tell me about all the rehab plans and which I have to do to get my shoulder back. But can I just tell you, my shoulder didn't seem very significant until it hurt. And that's true. So you don't realize the significance of gifts until you see a gift missing. And that's true of the local body. That's Paul's point here, which is why he continues to help people see that. Now, look, real quickly, hold your spot, and we're going to pick up some lightning speed here. But I want you to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. So hold your spot there. We'll come back to it, and we're going to work through the gifts in a second that you see in verses 6 and following. But one of the things that Paul does here is he writes to the church of Corinth, and he's going to write about the same issue of the church of Corinth, but in greater detail. Now, I am convinced that one of the reasons he goes into greater detail with the church of Corinth is that the church of Corinth has a handful of humility problems. They also have some uh, argumentative problems. Now, we know earlier in the book, and if you're reading with us along in, in our reading plan through 1 Corinthians, you know and have seen that the church of Corinth is arguing about a handful of divisive things. They, are, they have spent time arguing about 
who it was they heard the gospel from. Some of them will go, oh, well, uh, Peter told, shared the gospel with me. Some will go, well, it was Paul that shared the, 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 uh, the gospel with me. Others will go, well, it was uh, Apollos that shared the gospel with me. And they are arguing about who it is that discipled them and shared the gospel. And that's a divisive thing. It moves, though, from not just who d- discipled me, but who baptized me. In which Paul actually writes to the, ch- to the church of Corinth. And he goes, I am so glad that I didn't baptize many of you. Because at the end of the day, he goes, does it matter if I baptize you or if Peter or Apollos baptize you? He goes, I don't know that any of that's significant. He goes, the last time I checked, neither I or Apollos died for you. He goes, wasn't that Christ? Wasn't it Christ who did that for you? But that's the argument that's been taking place among the Corinthian church. And it doesn't just stop with who discipled them or who baptized them. It's also among the gifts. They're saying, well, I've got this gift. Well, I've got this gift. Well, this gift's greater than this gift. And they are taking the gifts that God has given among the local church, and the early church specifically, and they are arguing about them. And that's why Paul writes the context in which he does in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I want you to just see it and take note of what, what he says here. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we're going to pick up in verse 4 for the, just the sake of time. He says, now there are varieties of gifts. We've seen that. There's diversity, but the same spirit, unity. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it's the same God who empowers them all in every one. Equality. He goes, it is God that gives all these. And he says, to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit. Underline, underscore, highlight, circle, make note, for the common good. For the common good. Not for the good of us. Not to implore our great gifts among everybody else. Not to say, hey, look how gifted I am. And I'll tell you, friends, uh, we live in a day and age where people want the greater gifts. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't earnestly desire good things from God. And we shouldn't earnestly desire for his gifts to be good for the common good. The problem is, though, I think in the local church among our nation, we are celebrating in some ways the gifts to be represented of a spiritual maturity, or even furthermore, to in some ways make a name for ourselves. And when we make a name for ourselves, it never goes well. And the point that Paul is saying is it's all for the common good, which would bring me to point number four. If you haven't got it already, all gifts are given for the common good. That is clearly demonstrated in Romans chapter 12. It is clearly demonstrated in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. All the gifts are for the common good. And so even though the gifts are demonstrated in a variety of ways, they are for the common good. Each unique contribution, not for ourselves, but for someone else. And I think that's the challenge that Paul is ultimately going to talk to in 1 Corinthians 13 and 14 about some of the greater gifts that you would see about tongues and about healings and about these divine things. He goes, listen, if you're not careful, the promotion of all these gifts, he goes, it takes away the fundamental idea of the Trinity, which is order. It's not to be chaotic. It's not to be confusing. It's not about us. It's at the end of the day, it's about Christ, his church. It's about equality, diversity, the celebration of those often found most glorious in the order and the expression of the good gifts God's given us. Which is why we go to great lengths here, even at Stone Point, to make sure there's order in the way that we respond and worship to God. Because it pleases Him when there's order. And you could argue all day that order shouldn't be celebrated, but order is celebrated within the Trinity, is celebrated in our marriages and friends. It should be celebrated in the church. And it should not be something that we desire to manipulate or distort. Because at the end of the day, if it's not about us and it's about the common good, then we shouldn't worry about or desire what we desire most. Make sense? Something to think about. Paul then c- continues among the Corinthian church in verse 12. Friends, I'm skipping over a, a, a good section of gifts there. It's just because I don't have time to walk you through every single gift. If you have questions about it, when I have conversation, hey, I guess catch me in June, right? Verse 12, for just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. For if one spirit, we are all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, all are made to drink of the one spirit. He just makes sure that you know that all these things come from God. Verse 14, for the body does not consist of one member, but of many. Sound familiar? If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I don't belong to the body, that would not make any less part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I don't belong to the body, 
that would not make it any less part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of, of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members of the body, each one of them, as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. Got the point? Paul goes, listen, you, you can't say, oh, I'm an eye, because the eye is, is not indispensable. You could lose an eye, and ultimately you could still smell. You could lose both eyes, and ultimately you could still function, although not the way God designed at the end of the day, you could not have an arm and your body still be useful in a variety of ways. The point is, is that re- whether you are uh, seemingly what you think is insignificant or significant, he goes, it doesn't matter because all parts matter. And you won't realize that until you're missing a few parts. Make sense? Verse 21, he says, For the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again to the head of the feet, I have no need of you. Then look what he does here. This is so cool. On the contrary, underline that, it's really important. He says, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And of the parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor. And our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty. Now the question is, what part of the body do we create more modesty for? Well, let me just do a quick throwback to Genesis chapter 3. You got Adam and Eve, they're in the Garden of Eden, there's no sin. They have enjoyed all the presence of God. Then they take uh, a bite of the forbidden fruit, and all of a sudden they realize they're naked. When they realize that they're naked, what do they do? They run and they hide! Why? Because they've now realized that parts of their body need honor. What do they do? Without the asking of anyone, without the contribution of God or any of his advice, they take and they sew fig leaves together and they cover themselves, right? Remember that? I just think, if somebody busts open the shower door, and you're in the shower, and they're like, and you're like, ah! And then, you, like, if you have to grab the sh- shower curtain or whatever you do, you're going to, like, you're going to cover up, right? Now, some of us, because we're weird, we've had dreams about going to school, like, and you're like, don't have enough clothes on. You're like, it petrifies you. You wake up in the middle of the night, and you're sweating, right? <laughs> you're like, that shouldn't happen. Now, the point is that Paul makes here is this. He goes, Verse 24, which are more presentable parts do not require. He goes, you don't wake up and have night sweats because your face isn't covered or your arms aren't covered. Matter of fact, some of us go to great lengths and we get detailed tattoos so the whole world can see. We never cover them. And he goes, but there are parts of our body that are covered and they require modesty. And he goes, and we give them great you know, honor in that sense. His point is, Verse 24, but God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division of the body, but the members may have the same care for one another. He's going, listen, when's the last time that the church celebrated insignificant things? Like, when's the last time that the church realized that the significance is not around just a person who teaches or the lead singers when's the last time that you celebrated things and can i just tell you friends that oftentimes we don't see the significant parts in our body enough and and friends here's what i want you to hear is i take a a, a couple months and they bless me with rest it is not because i'm the only one working hard it is not because i have in some ways done greater things than anyone else here And I think you need to know that. I want you to realize there are people in our body each and every week who are putting on more hours of of time and significance, maybe, than even I do. And they are servants within our body. They are serving in region on Monday nights. And then they turn around and they lead journey groups on Thursday nights. And then they're here at band practice. They're the first to open the door. Sometimes they're the last to lock the door. And I oftentimes look up and I see people and their face and their names. And I go, how in the world do we get by without them? And yet you don't even know who they are. And we won't know who they are until what? They stop doing the things that God has encouraged them to do. I mean, friends, can I just tell you that oftentimes our our tech and our media people are the most unseen people until you see something not on the screen. And then we're like, man, why don't they have that up there? I can't write it down. Man, they they didn't leave that up long enough for me to write it. And those are the things I hear. I hear that, like, man, they're always going too fast or they don't. But the the challenge is is the, the things that they don't hear are like, hey, thank you for being here at six this morning. And running through that several times. Hey, thank you for being here extra nights of the week. And using your gifts even though you are never seen. 
See, there are areas of our body that are never seen and never celebrated until they make a mistake. And then there are other areas of the body that we think are significant and greater because they're always in front of you. And, and friends, I think if nothing else, the greatest area our church needs to grow is in that. And if I could bless our body more than anything and our staff, one of the things we shared with them a few weeks ago as we were just helping prepare them for my time away is just going, look, this is a celebration of you. This is a chance for you to shine. This is a chance for you to teach. This is a chance for our church to be encouraged by others. And it's time for me to get out of the way so that you can be all God's called you to be. That there's significance and great value and worth in the way you lead. And then you don't need me here for two months telling you that you did it wrong. It's just a good thing. And it should be celebrated more and more in our churches. Why? Because there's so many parts of the body that matter. Which is important because in 1 Corinthians 12, 26, look what he says. He goes, if one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. So friends that you are rejoicing with me, thank you. And I pray that you would know that if there's people that are suffering, we ought to likewise suffer. We ought to feel it when our bodies are having a hard time. Which means that these whole idea of number five, spiritual gifts all contribute to the whole. And I think my most significant point, how do you know if the part of the body is suffering if you're not connected to it? How do you celebrate with something you're not connected to? And so I would just implore you that if you're not connected in a meaningful way, that you would get connected. Because if not, then when you suffer, you'll suffer alone. And when you celebrate, oftentimes you'll, su- you'll just celebrate alone. And that's not the way that God intends his church to work together. And so I pray that it would cause you to pray about, consider, think about being in the game. Flip back to Romans chapter 12. Y'all got time for me to finish? If you said no, I was about to bring you up on stage and embarrass you. (laughs) I'm just kidding. I wasn't. I'm just joking. I I will run through them pretty quickly because for the sake of time, I want to be respectful of you and I'm thankful that you're here. Verse 6, it says, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. So he goes, let us use them by God's grace and with his help. And then he lists out a handful of them. Um, Obviously, this is not the extensive list of gifts. If you want an extensive list of gifts, you need to consider Romans 12, the little passage that I uh, missed over in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Uh, You can also go to Ephesians chapter 4, and you can also go to 1 Peter chapter 4. You, you've, you go through that, you can compile a pretty significant list of gifts in which oftentimes many are never talked about. But here's what you do need to know. He does talk about a handful of them to the Church of Rome. And so he says, if, if one of them is prophecy, he goes, do it in proportion to our faith. And he uses the word prophetia there, which a, a better biblical understanding of that in the context of what way Paul used it is not necessarily a foretelling of future events, but a foretelling of what God is doing. It can involve future events, but it would certainly be from the place of God's word. So it may be about an end times eschatology and a view of that. But at the end of the day, it's not this new divine revelation from God. What it is, is a, it's a desire to preach and proclaim ultimately the truth of the things that God is doing in the midst of his people in today's time and also in future events to prepare the way of ultimately Jesus and his return. In verse 7, it says, if it's service, it, do it in our serving. He uses the word diakonia there, which is the word that we would get servant from. Um, if you have come from places where you used to have deacons, the idea is that it's a service rendered. And he goes, at the end of the day, if it's service, do it in our serving. And there's a variety of ways that we render service in which you may think is significant or insignificant. At the end of the day, none of it's insignificant. All of it's important, and all of them are useful, and all of us ought to contribute to the greater whole in our serving. Because there are some that are going to have, in some ways, just a gift from God to have an inclination to serve. Now, we should all serve, but what I want you to realize, they have a greater inclination. You're going to see them doing things that most of us don't want to do. And I'll just tell you, one of the guys that I celebrate most here, and and I I hate to do that, but is a guy named Dick Patterson. The reason that Dick Patterson has been celebrated among my life so much is because he's the one person over the last 11 years who's asked me every day, what can I do for you? And secondly, he is also the guy who does all the things around here that no one wants to do. And I could make a list, literally a mile long, of the things that he does month in and month out that none of us would ever touch. And you'll never know that they're done, but Dick Patterson is the guy. And I will tell you that if there's a guy in whom you don't want to leave here, and we should celebrate and ultimately give a sabbatical to, I promise you it is him over me. 
because he is a servant and he has the gift of service. And I'm hoping he's not in this service because if he was, I wouldn't have said all those things, right? (laughs) He's a guy I love. He's a dear friend. And I'll tell you, he is one of the reasons I have maintained the course. Because in times where I have grown weary, he has maintained the work of doing good. And friends, if you don't have a guy like that in your corner, you need to get one. And I'm thankful that he's here. And listen, can I just tell you, there are many among us like him. And I'm thankful for them. But he's one I know personally. And I will go on record to say, I believe he deserves, as soon as I get back, a little chance to get away. Verse 8, the one who exhorts in his exhortation. He uses the word parakaleo there. It's the word that you would get like for the Holy Spirit, the comforter. So he uses this idea, the one who exhorts, he goes, let him do a variety of things in his exhortation. Now, when he used that word, it could mean a lot of different things. It could mean comfort, console. It could mean beseech or beg. It could be admonish or gently correct. Ultimately, the person who has the gift of exhortation also has to have the gift of wisdom. And here's why. Because they need to know when to kick you in the rear and they need to know when to console you. And that takes great wisdom. And there are some of us who need to be kicked in the rear and you need to be spurred on to greater things. And the person who can exhort knows the difference. The one who contributes in generosity. The word contributes there is the word methodidomy, uh, which literally means to give with liberality. It's only used twice in our whole Bible. Uh, in the NASB, it says, he who gives, give with liberality. Um, it's the idea of generosity. Now, all of us could say, well, we should all give with generosity. Paul even implores the church of Corinth in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7. I'll put it for you on the screen. He goes, each one of us is given his decide, uh, must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. You could say that about all of us. We should all give with cheerfulness. Well, what Paul is saying here to the church of Rome, he goes, there are some people who are just gifted to give with liberality. Like they're just wired. They just have a disposition to give everything they have away. And those are the type of people that you go, hey, how much do you spend? How much do you pay? And they go, I have no idea what I spend. They don't oftentimes keep receipts. They probably don't always manage their resources well because they don't care. At the end of the day, they just like, I don't know, not mine. I'm going to give it away. And so that's the type of person that he's talking about. They give with liberality. I'll tell you, that's not me, friends. I give. I want to give graciously, but I'm tight-fisted at times. Celebrate the ones who aren't. We need them. The one who leads with zeal. The word lead there is just the idea of someone who leads well. They persevere and they do it with zeal, meaning they don't tire out easily. Ultimately, the reason that we would want to celebrate our leaders and encourage them even to step away at times is so they, they do it with fervency and they come back with zeal. And then he closes the idea, and the one who does acts of mercy Ilio, which he goes, do it with cheerfulness. Um, do, it, do it with receiving mercy. And every time you would see this word in the New Testament, it always, almost always revolves around receiving mercy, not about being merciful. But how are we ultimately merciful? It's because we have received mercy. And I think about Matthew 5, 7, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. How are you merciful? merciful. How how do you forgive? How how do you give mercy? It's you know that ultimately God's been merciful to you. That's the idea. Let me close with this illustration of a guy named Niccolo Pagini. Uh, Niccolo Pagini was probably one of the greatest violinists that the entire world has ever seen. And uh, when uh, he came to a point to to retire um, some of his instruments, he gave a violin to the city in which he was born, uh, which was the the city of Genova, Italy. And when he gave that, he said, hey, listen, I'm giving it, but he goes, I'm only giving, give one, one demand. And he goes, and that is that when you take this, he goes, no one's ever to play this instrument again. Problem with taking an instrument that is that exquisite and that great of fine wood and never playing it again and render it useless is that over time, that wood will rot and decay and worms will eat away at it. To the point that this gift, though hundreds of years old, gets to the place where All that is is a case that the gift has been rendered useless. And friends, I think if not careful, that's what happens in the local church. Is that we have gifts from God, but 
for a variety of reasons, we oftentimes render them useless. We take our violin and we put it on the shelf and we go, I'm not going to do it again. And can I just tell you, it's for a variety of reasons. Sometimes it's because we see our gifts as insignificant. Sometimes it's because we don't even know what our gifts are. Sometimes it's because we've grown weary of doing good and we're tired. And we go, somebody else should carry my load or carry the load. Sometimes it's because we're hurt. Because we used our gift and somebody didn't like the way we're using it. Or they respond in a way that hurt me. The reality is, can I just tell you that none of those are good enough reasons for you not to be using your gifts. And and here's what I would just want to submit to you on one of the last handful of Sundays I have before you. Is that if I have stood in the way, if our elders have stood in the way of using your gifts. Or in some ways, maybe we hurt you along the way. Or in some ways, you didn't feel like you were meaningful. Listen, would you allow us just to come before you? And in humility, render ourselves before you and seek your forgiveness. Because we don't want to be the reason that you're not serving the body. We don't want you to to put your instrument on the shelf because in some ways someone stood in your way. Friends, would you allow us a chance to seek your forgiveness in that way? We would like to do that. I love you, church. Man, what a pleasure it is to be here and to serve you. And I can't wait to do that for another decade or two. Um... And I pray that we do it together using all of our gifts for the glory of God around the world with good and great vigor and strength. Let me pray for us. Father in heaven, thank you for this morning. Thank you for our time together. Lord, I pray that you would use your word to teach us, implore us, encourage us to do all that you desire. Lord, help us, Father, to just remind ourselves that every single gift from you is given for the common good. It's all all about unity and oneness and ultimately it's not about a significance or a maturity in our gifts that at the end of the day it's about faithfulness to the one who gave it and so lord i pray that the potter um, would look upon the clay and that you would use us for your glory i pray at the same time that the clay would not look back to the potter and say it's my gift and i'll do what i want lord i pray that we would ultimately surrender ourselves to you and one another for the common good so that our gifts bring glory and honor to your name throughout the earth. In Jesus' name, amen.